Hi, and welcome. We're really excited to see you today. Yes, and it's a warm welcome to all of you, and welcome to Think Differently by Design, listening tour with your host, Sharon Weinstein, and myself, Dina Redinger. We also are the co-authors of the book, Think Differently, 18 Strategies to Fix Broken Thinking. We want to invite you to engage with us and your peers forever, whoever is going to join us today as we address issues related to nurses, nursing, and the workforce. In our studies of those in leadership positions, we found that success happens when we ask the right questions so we can solve the right problem. Our prospective healthcare and writing careers make us uniquely qualified for this role as facilitators, and we want you to be a part of this. So please sign in, join in the comment section, tell us where you are, and please ask questions. We also invite you to be a part of the future programs. We have a few left participating in this 30 minute discussion using this LinkedIn Live platform. We conduct these interviews on Tuesdays and Thursdays every week throughout that first quarter of the year. As I said, we're getting close to the end. Our goal is to provide more nurse leaders with an opportunity to be heard, express your opinions, share ideas, and to tell your stories. Before we start, we want to acknowledge you and we want to thank you for being a part of this listening tour. It has been absolutely fantastic and we've learned so much from all of our guests that we've had on here and we have viewers across the globe so please use the chat let us know where you're from and also know that we will reply and comment to anything that you have and you'd like to respond to so Sharon I would like for you to introduce our guest today absolutely it's my pleasure and welcome everyone today we welcome my colleague Dr. Jeff Doucette senior vice president and chief nursing officer at Press Ganey Jeff is a widely recognized and accomplished nurse leader with nearly 30 years of experience spent largely in leadership and executive nursing roles. Throughout his career, he has focused on enabling the delivery of exceptional patient and family experiences through innovation, education, and nursing excellence. Most recently, Jeff served as Senior Vice President and Chief Nursing Officer at Thomas Jefferson University Hospitals in Philadelphia. In this role, he led the strategic direction and leadership of the Division of Nursing and Patient Care Services. And he also played a critical role in cultivating and sustaining nursing excellence. Prior to joining Jeff, oh, that's that's interesting. Prior to joining Jeff Health, Jeff Doucette served as vice president of the Magnet Recognition Program and the Pathway to Excellence Program at the American Nurses Credentialing Center. Welcome, Jeff Doucette. We're really happy to have you with us today. Give everybody a warm hi. Hi, welcome. Uh, thank you so much. And welcome, everybody. And thanks so much for joining us today. I used to have a lot of fun saying I was Jeff at Jeff when I worked at Jefferson. So that made me I like trouble. that. So thank you. Thank you so I much. I like that. It's me. the first time it tricked me up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like it. Okay. Uh, Dina, do you want to start Jeff off? Sure. So the first question is, um, tell us what the national picture is currently looking like for nursing engagement. Well, this is my favorite question to talk about. Um, so uh, as you heard in the introduction, as the chief nurse at Prescani, I have access to really the largest databases uh, in the country that show what is happening with our nursing workforce. And just um, in February, so last month, we updated all of our data sets around nursing engagement. And I've kind of dubbed my, uh, my roadshow for the next few months as making the case for hope. Um, and that is because what we are seeing in the national nursing engagement picture is that nursing engagement is actually starting to stabilize and in some um, organizations uh, improve across the board. So it does look like uh, the 2021 uh, data set was probably our lowest point. Um, many organizations have stabilized in their data sets in 2022. And what we're seeing is that in magnet organizations in particular, that those organizations are actually improving at a much more uh, dramatic rate. So overall, when we look at the kind of key indices of nursing engagement, like uh, re uh, resilience, which is measured by the subscales of activation and decompression, um, we're seeing that those things are actually starting to improve slightly across the board. So I think there is reason for hope. Um, and I do think uh, we are starting to see light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, we do need hope. There's no question whatsoever. Stephanie from Kansas City says, how can we access that data set? 
So um, if you are a Prescani client, um, we um, will happily provide that data set to you. Uh, and if not, you can go to the Prescani website and there are a series of blogs and publications that we have that highlight all of our different data sets. Um, and we share those on a pretty regular basis. You can also follow me uh, on LinkedIn where I post all of our new data insights about once a month. Great, that's great. So we talked a little bit about the whole concept of engagement. What is the data showing in terms of the drivers of long-term RN retention? It's one thing to recruit mm -hmm. nurses. We all know that many, many nurses now drop out within the second year of nursing school. They're done. And then the huge percentage that finish stay six months and they're done. Tell us about the drivers of long-term RN retention. So um, this is always a really interesting conversation. So I love when I'm with a group of people and I ask them to just drop into the chat, like what do they think are the reasons that people are leaving their organizations? And hands down, the number one and number two things that I always hear from people are staffing and pay as the key drivers of why people are leaving organizations. Interestingly, though, the data do not support that at all. And so let me talk you through a little bit about how we look at this. So at Prescani, we do more nursing workforce engagement surveys than any other organization in the country. So just in the last year, we'll do about 1.7 to 1.8 million healthcare engagement surveys. About 40% of those are from registered nurses. We measure about 30 long-term drivers of retention in that survey, the top five drivers of long-term RN retention are that nurses like the work that they're doing. They feel like they can deliver safe, effective, error-free care. Their organization values diversity, equity, and inclusion. Their organization conducts business in an ethical way and that they feel supported by their team of uh, co-workers so that they feel good about their team. Those are the top five long-term drivers of three-year retention. At the very bottom of this list of 30 items are pay and staffing, and they wow. always compete for the last place on the list. What we find, though, is that it's a real easy reason for nurses to tell their manager why they're leaving because they don't want to say, I don't feel supported by you or right. I don't feel like the culture here is positive. So we call those top five drivers the healthcare must-haves, and it really is the work of leadership and, interestingly, doesn't cost your organization anything to focus on those top five drivers. Right. They're available. They're free, basically. Are they not? Absolutely. They're readily available. They take a little bit of initiative a lot of gut, a lot of heart, a lot of empathy to make that happen. Absolutely. You're right. A nurse can't leave and say, well, you don't value DE&I and therefore I don't want to be a part of this organization. It is easier to place blame and easier to place blame on that concept of, gosh, it's about the pay. Mm -hmm. They always say it's about the pay, but we all know it's not really about the pay. Right. And, well, and then they always say it's about staffing. Oh, you know, I have too much of an acuity level. I have too many patients. I have too much of this. I have whatever. Yeah. Well, let me say a couple of things about that. So your pay and benefits have to be fair and competitive for the market. I mean, that's just a given. But what we know from the data are that when those things are competitive, that nurses are far more forgiving about those things um, that are lower on the list, like pay, benefits, staffing, scheduling, those types of things, and really focus on those top drivers that we talked about. But let me say one other thing um, about um overall engagement um, for nurses. So we know from our data sets that one of the key ways to drive a positive practice environment is to reduce the friction points that nurses experience in their everyday work. So it's not that nurses don't want to go to work every day and deliver the best care. They do. But we put so many barriers in place by having poor processes, friction points. We don't have enough resources in non-nursing departments. So nurses take on the brunt of other things that, that don't require their skill set. So we work with a client in um, Health First in Melbourne, Florida, and their chief nurse, Cheyenne Fisher, uh, really led an effort there to reduce these friction points for their nursing. Wow. And I actually published a blog about it that we call Eliminate, Automate, and Delegate, where we're asking nurse leaders to look at the activities mm -hmm. that their nurses are doing and what are the things that can be eliminated or that they stop doing. What are the things that can be automated in a way that makes sense, either using artificial intelligence or improving mm -hmm. the burden that exists in documentation now? And finally, what can be delegated from nurses that um, they don't need to be doing that can reduce some of these friction points? That's another key factor in creating this positive practice environment. 
I want to go back to uh, the Melbourne um, story here and what they've done to reduce that burnout. What kind of percent reduction in burnout did they find when they actively chose that eliminate, automate, and delegate? Can you give me some sort of a number on that? Like, yeah, so so I don't have their um, data uh, readily in front of me, but what I will say is that in talking with the organization there, they have seen improvements in their retention of staff, their reductions in burnout, particularly among nurse leaders, as well as improved job enjoyment uh, with their staff as they've looked at ways to get nurses really focused on, um, I think what is a lot of people talk about as top of licensure practice, right? So what are the skills that I should be doing as a registered nurse that, that um, require my education, training, knowledge, and experience? So the more that they've done that, they have seen improvements um, in their vacancy rates, improvements in their retention, and reduction in their burnout scores. Um, I don't have those exact figures in front of me, but we work with them very closely um, and, and know that those uh, improvements are sustained as they've taken this on as a major uh, organization-wide initiative. I love that. So I want to kind of go back to that just a little bit. It's now it's got my curiosity. Just right. Mine too. Go ahead, Dina. <laughs> and let you so when you talk about things that require my knowledge, so they had to actively identify the things that required their nursing knowledge and then decide the categories that they would fall in. Is that kind of what I'm hearing you say? Yes. And, and you think about the types of work that um, nurses should be doing, right? Like right. care planning and, and really coordinating care, a planning discharge, medication teaching, all of those things that, that require the education of a nurse, really using their critical thinking to evaluate all the different inputs that they're receiving about their patients. But what many nurses have been, um, you know, burdened with lately is doing a lot of non-nursing associated tasks. Yeah. Yes. And so it really was about how do we categorize all mm -hmm. of the things that nurses are doing and figuring out of the things that nurses should be doing, what of those things can they eliminate, automate, and delegate? I'm going to jump in here because this is really fascinating to me. For years, we have talked about nurses doing non-nursing work. That's how we got unit clerks or unit assistants or whatever else you want to call them. A lot of that work that nursing was doing was then turfed over to non-licensed personnel to do those sorts of things. How has that changed? Is this just some cyclical episode and it's it's maybe it's a reality <laughs> show that is ongoing? What is it? So I, I do think, um, as you mentioned in my introduction, in, in May of this year, I will have been a nurse for 30 years and I've been around long enough now to know that everything kind of recycles itself back in one way shape or form um, in our profession. But what I will say I think is a little bit different about this approach is that, um, you know, in the last 10 years, we have gotten much, much, much better data about care processes using electronic health records. So now we have great data about how broken things are. <laughs> and um, so I think that we are just looking at things in a little bit different lens. And, and when you look at any um, clinician category of burnout drivers, the electronic health record is always in the top three of what drives physician burnout, what drives nursing burnout. And so as we think about taking these processes where our highly trained clinicians have become highly paid data entry clerks, um, there is much to be done in terms of how we are interacting with these electronic systems and the tasks that we are doing as a result. And so I think this approach that was used at Health First is a really, really good one. Um, in, in other performance improvement language, some people call it the start, stop, continue exercise. So it's mm -hmm. fairly similar, right? There's so many things in healthcare that we have always done because just that's the way we've always done it, or that's been the tradition, that we continue mm -hmm. to add things on top without saying, what can we stop doing? Um, mm -hmm. you know, my favorite example of this is from years ago when we used to fax the OR schedule to 200 different departments every day. And we had these performance improvement teams and everybody was agonizing about who should we send it to? Who do we not send it to? And finally, I got so tired of going to these meetings. I said, guess what? Starting tomorrow, we're not going to send it to anybody. And let's see who calls and asks for it. And like 10 people <laughs> Great called. Idea. Right. So Great. 10 people called and said, oh, we really need this. So we figured <laughs> out a way to send it to 10 people. And instead of spending 
hours and days and days trying to retool processes and just stop yeah. doing stuff. And, and so I think sometimes we, we overthink um, the solutions uh, to these things. That's why I love this framework that they came up with at Health First. Well, I love that idea that you just generated when you talked about only sending it to the people who asked for it, because <laughs> I have memories of fax machines in doctor's offices that sit there with loads of paper and nobody knows which fax is for which doctor in the practice and what goes where. Yeah. And yeah, if it and jams, I, you're totally ruined, right? And we're all dating ourselves talking about faxes, but it's all, you know, email, it's the same kind of, it's the same concept, you know, that, that this um, work that we do, we accept this as this is how it has to be done. Yes. Um, right. And sometimes the best thing to do is just stop doing it and see what happens. Exactly. Because I'm not sure that an electronic fax or an email fax made it any better. Right, right. I'm not sure that that happened. What? What's interesting is that I'm coaching a, a big health system right now, coaching senior leaders with some of the same things, right? Reducing burnout, resilience, how to be able to accomplish their, their vision for what they really need. What's interesting, they just kind of completed looking at what are the bigger complaints? What's causing the burnout, right? I'm doing things that are non-clinical. I'm, you know, taxed with this, I'm taxed with that. So they did their own research coming to find out, well, the facts are much clearer now right sometimes you know there's a lot of like you said kind of naysaying could be complaining it could be very real but we don't know until we survey to see what are you doing what can we start what can we stop what's critical right so they're going through that right now it's very interesting that um hearing some of the same things that sometimes people perception isn't reality as well so then how do we change that right and and getting a clearer picture of what's actually happening but this undertone of fear of being able to speak up is really some of the issues i think that we're kind of taxed with how do you address that you know in organizations yeah so you know we strongly believe and understand from all of our work that we do in the safety world as the largest patient safety organization in the country is that having psychological safety is the fundamental element and cornerstone of any good safety, quality, reliability, and service approach. So, and, and when I say service, I, I mean things like engagement, patient engagement, employee engagement, and not having psychological safety creates all kinds of problems, especially for the workforce and driving burnout. Um, we believe and understand that a multi-channel continuing list, continuous listening strategy is what we are seeing in the top decile performing organizations in terms of engagement, culture, and safety. That those organizations have fully integrated a high reliability approach with a continuous listening strategy um, in order to hear from employees and the people who are doing the work where these friction points exist. We've gotten so good at this on the patient experience side that um, you know we can tell you um, we can predict for you based on the type of friction that a patient might experience, say scheduling a physician's appointment or trying to get a test done in a hospital, we can predict where their engagement is going to be and show how that friction impacts their overall engagement. We're now developing the same type of intelligence around employees so that we will be able to tell organizations, we can we can tell you this now, we're just putting it in a, a really cool kind of uh, a tool that we're gonna have available very soon, that if an employee experiences these types of frictions at work, how it erodes their overall engagement. And not being able to speak up about this in a psychologically safe way is one of the absolute killers of a work culture instantaneously. Mm -hmm. And it takes just one time mm -hmm. that an employee tries to speak up about something and either there is retaliated against or feels like there it falls on deaf ears um, and it just won't happen again. And that's where we see serious safety events um, root cause more often than we would like. That's interesting because Tim Clark in his book talked about the fact that to increase communication and improve psychological safety as a whole, you have to work systematically and that workers need to feel safe and included before they can openly share any kind of a differing opinion. And we all have differing opinions. We've all got a different opinion on how something happens. He goes on to talk about when anxiety or fear of rejection is replaced by trust. That's when people feel less afraid. That's when they own their mistakes. That's when they see that this as an opportunity for improvement. 
rather than retaliation. And that's really what you're talking about. Right. And we're talking about this, I think, now in terms of a culture of safety. But when you think about it from an employee engagement lens, it really is the same principle, right? When people see that there is something broken in a culture, um, they are far more likely to leave if they don't think that people in leadership are listening and or understand. Um, so, you know, the ways we like to see that continuous listening strategy is, you know, leader rounding, pulse surveying, annual employee engagement surveys, all of these things are ways that employees perceive that leaders are listening. Now, the worst thing you can do is to have all of those channels and then never take any action. So I think open, honest, and real-time communication about the struggles that employees are having are critically important. And we started at the beginning talking about hope. And I've always said that hope is not a strategy, but right now, hope and a plan are the two things that every employee wants to hear from the their leader in healthcare. And when I say a plan, this isn't a two, three, five year glossy strategic plan. It's like, what are you doing in the next 30 days to help us with the problems that we're having right now? And leaders being very transparent about how they're communicating. That's really where I think the difference maker is in the top decile performers right now. You know, I love that. Um, you know, I think taking these smaller chunks of time so that people can really grasp a real intent of senior leadership, but I'd love for you to speak to you about the alignment above the chief executive, chief nursing officer, above your you know, leading nurses. Can you speak to that? Where do you see the biggest challenges and where the biggest success? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge is creating that alignment, right? Because um, I always, when I would do orientation for new employees, I always showed what I, think about my org chart in my mind. And it was the upside down pyramid with me, the chief officer is the least important person and our bedside frontline clinicians as the most important. And that every leader and educator and everybody in between was there to be supporting the, the front work, uh, frontline work at the sharp edge of care. And when I talk to boards, I have that same conversation that the board of directors is the least important people in the room, but their most important function is making sure that they are creating alignment from the top of the organization down. Mm -hmm. And so again, when you have this uh, psychologically safe environment and there's open channels of communication, everybody at all levels should be seeing the same communication, the same information, the same feedback from employees. And when you have this kind of um, top down, bottom up, um, communication strategy. So kind of communication is happening at all levels and that messaging is um, the same. That is where we see the alignment happening. So the strategy is important, but we can no longer think about healthcare in three to five year uh, increments right. because the game has dramatically changed over the last few years. Um, and so really thinking about 12 to 18 months out is probably um, the furthest that any organization should be planning right now. I love it. Yeah. You know, Keith, Keith so says I. here, you're clearly taking action. Salute hope is a plan. I love it. I love and it I'm too. Sharon, I know you've got something else that's on your tongue. What do you would like to share? Well, well first of all, Sharon, <laughs> Sharon Herbert had a couple of comments as well. Yeah. Communication matters greatly. Mm -hmm. And thank you for that, Sharon. And leaders connecting to staff. That really is what it's all about. They need to feel connected. So when you talked about that vision of a an organizational chart, I could picture it. I saw that deep funnel. How do members of the board of directors feel about being perhaps the least important people in that totem pole? How do they feel about that as a part of the organization? So boards that get it understand that. Um, and they understand that their job is to give organization leaders the tools and resources that they need to be successful. Um, and so um, it is always concerning to me when I have that conversation and um, people don't get it. Um, that to me is more telling um, than great executive leaders who really understand that that is their role, that their role is to be supportive and provide tools and resources. So, um, you know, I think the best uh, senior leaders at that even board level really understand that and connect with that. So in essence, they're really there to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Their job is to facilitate all the the money and resources needed for all these complex solutions. Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly yeah. right. Dina, back to you. So, Jeff, I want you to tell us, what would you tell the younger version of yourself knowing where you sit today? So um, I love uh, that question. Um, 
So when I was uh, very early in my nursing career, I really thought that I, um, or I made a commitment to myself that I was going to get as much formal education as I could, um, that I was going to really study the craft of whatever I was practicing at the time. So whether it was emergency or trauma, or flight nursing, or even early as a nurse leader. So I felt like things like certifications and formalizing my education and things like that were really important tools for me to have in my toolbox. And I worked with a lot of people who were very critical of that. Um, and I remember when I was finishing my BSN, people saying to me, well, you're not getting any more money. Why are you doing that? And mm -hmm. I never let de people detract me from what my goals were mm -hmm. to make sure that I had the right tools in the toolbox. And I was not afraid to take risk. Um, and so what I would tell myself is that all of those things that you thought early on were really important, in fact, were really important. And don't let anyone derail you in that thinking, because um, if not for all of those um, opportunities uh, that I generated for myself and that great people were put into my life at just the right time to mentor and coach me, I would not be where I was today. I think the second piece of advice I would give my younger self is that you will learn as much or more from your failures than you do from your successes. So know that the pain of failure is only temporary. Um, and if you use it as a learning opportunity, you will continue to grow. Yeah, there's a key statement in there. If you use it as a learning opportunity it. versus a, defi a, a defining piece of who you are. Don't lose who you are is what I heard you say. Stay true to what you know you want and you need and get after it and keep going, right? So I love that. But definitely yeah. use it. Use yeah. it wisely. Yeah, I got that same impression. The other yeah. thing is that when you're doing these things and you're advancing yourself and you're getting that extra degree, even though somebody is putting it down, you are doing it really for yourself as well. Yes. You're doing it to be a better version of you. And that matters right. to each and every one of us. Yes, it does. Yes. You know, it reminds me of the days when my father said, well, don't study that foreign language. You'll never go to college. You know, it's not important. <laughs> Just learn to type. You'll never be anything. You'll never amount to anything. I think that a lot of us heard messaging like that, yep. perhaps as we were growing up and it defined right. us. So the idea is take those educational opportunities, take those mentors who enter your life, take those great people with whom you're surrounded and yep. learn from the experience and be a better version of yourself. I love it. Yes. You know, and we wanted to invite a lot of people to this retreat that we're coming up here in Branson on November the, the 1st through the 4th. And we're taking all of the, the pieces, these nuggets of wisdom and trying mm -hmm. to create, you know, something very palatable, something that you can take within your organization. We want you to be a part of this. We can't stress this enough. We've heard from Jeff. We saw the evidence with Bernadette Meldick as well. She was with us last week. Amazing. Um, we've heard from a whole litany of amazing guests here on our um, tour. And I cannot stress enough that it is up to us to help carry this message out. We want to make sure that we use the best of everyone by thinking differently, making sure that we're solving the right problem at the right time, because that's critical to the success of what we see in the future of healthcare. Back to you, Sharon. Yeah, great. So as always, our time is running short. It's time to come to a close. We always find, Jeff, that with people like yourself, we could be chatting for the next four hours. There is Absolutely. so much to talk about and so much work to be done <laughs> and so much knowledge to be shared. But unfortunately, the time takes control. Yes. Yes. And so we want to take this opportunity to thank you yes. and also Press Gainey for allowing you to be with yes. us today. We really have learned a great deal in a very short period of time. We have. And for those folks who are not yet affiliated with Press Gainey, Perhaps this is your moment to check that website, go online, check it out, check out the see blog. what's going on, see yep. what is offered, be a part of that solution mm -hmm. and use the tools that are available to you yep. because they are there. Do it. Yes. And thank you, Angela, for that great discussion. Yeah. Yes. yes, it has been a great discussion. So we you, appreciate Jeff. and value you, Jeff. Do you have one last comment for our viewers before we sign off? So I'll just say thank you again for having me. I always love our conversations. And what I would just say is everyone, just please keep hope alive. Things are getting better and we'll continue to get better. And it takes every single one of you to help us lead the way. So thank you. I love again. it. Thank you. I love Jen. it too. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for joining us today. For everybody. See you next care. time. Thank you.